Do you hear it? I'm not sure. Is this confirmation bias? We're also joined here with Mike Troiano, our law and crime trial analyst. Mike, while you were listening to that for the first time, I was kind of looking at your facial reaction as you, I can see you <laughs> lean in close and try to hear it. Explain to me what I was seeing when you heard it for the first time. I, I'm trying to give an unbiased uh, opinion on what I heard, and this is the very first time I've heard this 911 tape. I can't honestly say I hear cheating whore or, or any of it. I mean, they need to bring in some sort of expert uh, to give a better audio sample of this for me to be able to say with a straight face that I hear what the state is alleging. I, I would agree as well. I mean, I've heard the same thing. And my fear is that, that the more you hear it and the more you think it's supposed to be there, is a jury just going to say, I don't know, I've listened to it a thousand times and I thought I was supposed to hear it, I thought I was supposed to hear it, and now I hear it. But at least I think for most people, when the first time you've heard it, I, I think your uh, response is some of the most authentic response I've seen from everyone around here. Paula, you, you've talked about the discovery issue in terms of this coming in and how it should have been worked out, but you also talked about getting someone to really analyze this because we're hearing a lot of background noise. We're hearing a lot of shuffling of, I'm assuming, clothing in the background that's giving off some sound in the background. If the prosecutor truly believed this, why not give us an expert who can clean up the sound and get it as clear as day and so we can all hear if we can truly get that conviction they want? Well, I, I think that this happened very spontaneously and this was, this was not something that the prosecutor preempted, put out there for the defense. I think the defense was caught by surprise. I think the defense should have stood up and objected like crazy. The fact that this prosecutor is saying, do you hear go to hell cheating here? I mean, maybe cheating, maybe whore, but certainly no one's hearing go to hell. So I think she's really going to town with trying to prejudice the, the jury with her confirmatory bias theory here. And um, and I think that at, this should have been litigated. This, if, if they were going to do this, the defense should be making a motion for a mistrial, and and there should be you know some expert testimony here, or something more than what we're saying. It's extremely prejudicial and inappropriate. Yeah, I think um, from a prejudicial standpoint, I, I I wholeheartedly agree with you. And as I as I'm thinking through what you're saying now, Paula, um, Eklund, I, I want to run this argument by you. The prosecutor's testifying. There's no yeah. witness who's actually saying, I analyzed this, this audio recording, I looked at this document, I, I came up with the transcript, and this is what was said, and now I'm confronting the defendant with it. She's testifying as to what she hears. The bell has been rung. No one can unhear it, and now we're all assuming what's there, and what if he's found guilty based on the testimony of someone who's not supposed to testify? Well, here's, here's the thing. It's, it's brilliant. She waited until he testified. So you know that there are risks when the defendant testifies. You can be impeached. And she used it as impeachment evidence. He, she said he didn't kill her. He was like, well, hold on. Here's this video. Here's this recording. So um, she went through like this, this little loophole. And I think it comes in. Because although, yes, you can't unring the bell, but he knew, um, you know, say he knew the <laughs> the issues when you testify on your own behalf. He knew that he was going to be cross examined to the point of no return. He knew that the prosecution knew um, has a theory in this case, and that you know they believe that he murdered his wife. He knew that and took the stand. They were going to do no holds barred, and that's what they did. <sighs> Sally agree with you, Eklund, and, and it begs the question as to whether or not he should have testified. Um, but oftentimes, the jurors want to hear the defendant, and maybe this is the only chance they had. Let's continue to listen to the testimony of Todd Mullis as he took the stand. So if you're watching live the Mullis case, they're coming back now. There are going to be no rebuttal witnesses, and they're just giving jury instructions. So while they're doing that, we're going to continue to comment here. Um, Paula, in terms of what you're hearing from this defendant, I know that you said he had a pretty good, a pretty flat affect, but you didn't see anything in terms of guilt from him as to how he described the incident. I, you know, I more and more am thinking they made the right decision by putting this guy in the stands. I know it's the thing that you never do because it's risky, but I, I am finding that I am sympathetic to him. I feel sorry for him. I get the impression from the photos that we saw that they, he really was in love with her and he was trying to make this marriage work. And again, we go back to the fact that if there is anyone who's been cheated on um, or has any experience with this, 
they are going to feel his pain, his agony, the fact that, you know, he lost his mind. Um, this was heat of passion. And I think the prosecutor did a really poor job in cross-examining him. When I was listening to the footage of this on the way here, um, I couldn't tell if she was a prosecutor or the defense lawyer. She called him Todd, Todd. She was, she was very motherly with him. Um, she, she did a really bad job, and, and um, I thought she, she humanized him, which is something you're not supposed to do if you're cross-examining a witness. Yeah, it's interesting how that, how that all worked down. Um, Acklin, what are you seeing from this, uh, I guess, both the direct and cross-examination of defendant? Uh, I would have thought, and I agree with Paula, that when the prosecutor gets their turn to really get at the defendant, they're going to go for body shots and head shots and go for a knockout. But I didn't see that. Because it's, it's the small town in Iowa. You know, everybody knows each other. They're saying words like corn rakes. Like, that's a thing. You know, corn rakes and things of that nature. So it's like a small town. So um, understand this, that the jury is from that town. You don't have that, you know, it's not a high population. And so with small town, small towns, you have to tread lightly. You can't do the big city, you know, you know, annihilation like we have in Atlanta or in New York, you have to tread lightly. And um, they are a little bit more familiar, the prosecution with the defense. So um, I think that that's just because it's a small town. And I do agree with your guest in, in the sense that he was humanized, but he was humanized since the beginning. This man has to answer to murder charges. All the while, the whole world knows that his wife cheated on him, not once, but twice. So um, he's going through some things, uh, you know what I'm saying? So these things can be used by the defense, but I wouldn't fault the prosecution for being real familiar because it's a small town. Yeah, that'd be interesting. We're gonna continue more with this case, waiting for summations coming up, hopefully any minute now. Make sure you come back here for here, Law and Crime Trial Network.